radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, good evening. How are you doing? Fade to Black. Today is Tuesday, February 20th, 2024. Let's do this, man. Yeah, let's do this tonight. Billy Carson is with us. We've got a lot to talk about. We're going to focus on, uh, I'm so excited about this, been working on this for a long time, his new series, Anunnaki. We'll be talking about that and and everything else. Billy, I have no idea how many times he's been on the show, how many times we've hung out or talked or discussed or theorized or tripped or did, did all that stuff. When I say tripped, I mean, going on trips, not, not what you kids are thinking, but, but the conversation is going to go where it is going to go. Very excited. We're going to be doing all of that tonight with Billy. And while you are here, get yourself a fade to black t-shirt links are below two ways to get them. And uh, if you get a game changer membership, you will not only get your shirt autographed, but uh, you get Fade to Black Blend Coffee, too, as well. Shipping is included. The links are below. Two ways to get them, two links. All right? So help support the show and everything that we do around here. I want to remind everybody tonight, Billy is with us. Tomorrow night, Mary A. Joyce is here. We're going to be talking about her new book, Spy in the Sky. That's right. Satellite Imagery of UAP, E.T., up there and down here, Antarctica, under the oceans, on land, in the sky. We're going to be doing all of that tomorrow night with Mary A. Joyce. And then Thursday, yes, I got around to it. It's the 2024 Conscious Life Expo recap special. I've got all of the images ready to go, and video, too, as well. So we're going to do that on Thursday night. That completes our amazing week here on Faded Black. Tonight, it's Billy Carson. We're going to be talking about his new series, Anunnaki, uh, the plans for 2024. Uh, it's going to be premiering across the country. We're going to be talking about that. And we've got a very, very special announcement tonight that uh, it's going to be heard for the first time right uh, right here, right now, tonight on the show. He is the founder and CEO of Forbidden Knowledge, Inc. He's the best-selling author of the Compendium of the Emerald Tablets. Woke doesn't mean broke. I had the honor and privilege to write the forewords to both of those books. And his latest with Matt LaCroix, The Epic of Humanity, number one right now on Amazon, and we're going to talk about some other stuff, too, that he's working on. And uh, he is also, now, look, there's ForbiddenKnowledge.com, and there is ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Both of the links are below. Yes, there's a lot of things that are going on right now, Bentley giveaway and other things, and you can do that with the links that are below. Uh, I do want to mention really quick that, uh, you know, I want to bring Billy in. The more I talk right now about Billy, the less we get to hear from Billy. But he, uh, he got a certificate of science with an emphasis on neuroscience at MIT and has a certificate in ancient civilization from Harvard University. Uh, he is the CEO of First Class Space Agency right there in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Florida. Specifically, the space agency is involved in research and development of alternative propulsion systems and zero-point energy devices. His links are below. I want to welcome back. 
back to fade to black our friend billy cart billy 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 hey what's up jimmy <laughs> how are you man how are you great. hey hey um uh, great to have you here we've got a lot to uh we've got a lot to unpack tonight we've got a lot of work to do tonight and we're going to get to all of that but i wanted to just start off with this okay um you don't hear it enough and neither does the community but i want to thank you for your service a but b thank you, thank you for your friendship and you. and you and elizabeth and i uh when we post the, you know pictures of us on social media those are real images oh yeah there are three friends that uh, that that not only get things done but trust each other, and people will say all the time, "Man, how do they do it?" Well, mm -hmm. you know how you know is it real? How did they? I want to do. You know what? The answer is really simple: go and get it done, and don't stop. That's yeah. it. There's no secret. <laughs> there is no secret to this, is there? Just just find yourself people that you trust that will listen to you. You can take criticism from, you mm -hmm. can dish it back out. You listen, you collaborate and you get it done. And, and th there's no secret recipe is there. It's really that simple. Yeah. We just grind, man. We just grind and we, we try to mix a little bit of fun in with the grinding, but we're just grinding and working nonstop, coming up with new ideas and finding ways to continue to expand and reach more people. But at the same time, we like to have fun because if you don't have any fun, then it's going to make everything else just too dull and monotonous. So we mix a little bit of fun along with the work and we just get it done, man. We No excuses. No excuses. No excuses. Like uh, the conversation Billy and I had before the show about working out. <laughs> okay, so enough of that. Um, but but just just thank you. Our friendship, everybody, is is real. Yeah. So you've got you've got people around you that you trust. I don't uh, go and 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 honor that trust and 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 go and and kick the world's ass. That's all. That's it. That, that, that there's there's uh, no secret to it. None. Um, uh, I, I kind of want to start here. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in 2024 that you had booked. A couple of years ago, uh, you and Elizabeth and I got together and we plotted out 2023. Yeah, and uh, and I remember that night and we had napkins, right? <laughs> We're like you know, you, literally, you know, laying things out, and it was a crazy year. We got all of that done, and we all knew that okay, once once it's like this, people's expectations you 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 don't let your foot off the gas. Right, two thousand and twenty four is here. We're doing the same thing. Right throughout 2024, and and that's what you do. Big things are happening right now, um, yeah. and so first off, uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to I'm going to pop this up on the screen. Congratulations okay. for that, young man. Thank you. Yes, the epic you. of you. And um, what is special about this? I want to ask you about you and Matt's approach to this. Yeah. This is a collection of ancient scripts mm -hmm. uh, and, and books and tablets and things. Yeah. Um, and that that sounds simple. That's not easy to do. No. You've got to make those choices. How did you and Matt uh, put this thing together? Well, we wanted to come up with a book that, first of all, would have the most references to ancient texts, papyruses, cylinder scrolls, um, writing, scriptures, and everything else from all around the world, even some indigenous verbal handed down uh, histories as well from indigenous cultures around the world. But we want, wanted to do it in a way where we can lay it out um, in almost a chronological order and give people some sense of what may have happened deep in antiquity leading up to our current era and what how, how we've come into the to be in the situation we are in right now 
And so uh, we wanted to lay it out in a way that the average person can understand it. We want, wanted it to be very scholarly. And throughout the entire book, the entire book is a, is a reference book. Every single area where we reference a specific text, papyrus, scripture, cylinder, scroll. Uh, we also then take ex excerpts from that and list those, what we feel are the most important excerpts that people need to really re read and digest in the book. Uh, and so this is a one of a kind book. There's no other book like it in the world in terms of the amount of ancient text in one actual book. And I think that's why it hit number two out of 32.5 million books across all categories on Amazon. It hit number two and it hits number one in three categories right now at this moment in ancient civilization. So the book is doing phenomenal numbers. And, and here's why that is so important. It's it, people reference or say things uh, about different ancient scripts all of the time. Mm -hmm. And and people hear that. Now you've got to go and chase them down. Yeah. And that's not that's <laughs> not an easy thing to no. do. <laughs> it's, but once you uh, this is the first book where all of the, not all, because it's not all, the, but where you have a single point of reference to go to, to pull down and read what so many other researchers have taken the time over the years to find. The right. ancients wrote this for us, right? And we need to have access to it. And that's exactly what this book does, doesn't it? That's exactly what it does. We're, What's happening here, if a person were to go out and buy every single book or, you know, a, a, a decipher every translation of all these texts in a book, they'd have to buy dozens and dozens of books. They'd probably spend, I don't know, eight, nine hundred dollars. Some of this stuff is so ancient and so out of distribution or publication. Some of those are on eBay for like a thousand dollars or whatever. If you want a really nice copy. So this book saves you. First of all, it saves you a lot of money because for twenty nine ninety five or whatever it is, you're getting all this ancient text, but the most important parts of those texts that I feel really impact our consciousness today and give people a chance to actually finally read some of these things without having to go, well, where do I go and find this stuff? I keep hearing them say Enuma Elish or Mahabharata or Bhagavad Gita, or what about these Indian bays? What, what part of the Indian bays? Because they're massive. And so all of a sudden, here we come with the book that breaks it all down and it gives you the most important excerpts. And now when you talk to people, you can say, well, I've read some of this text. I've read some of these Sumerian tablets. I've read some of the Epic of Atrahasis or the Epic of, of, Epic of Gilgamesh. I understand what's going on in the Code of Hammurabi or the Myth of Atana or all these, all these other ancient texts and so forth. So now you're adding to your knowledge base in a way that would have that would that made it so easy. Otherwise, it would have been extremely difficult and time consuming. And also for some people, financially, it would have been impossible. Yeah. And the, the other part is, you know, honestly, you want to be able to be part of the conversation when it goes down. You're at a party, mm -hmm. you're at front, you're thing, you're at a conference, yeah. and you're with a group of people and this conversation starts. You don't want to be on the outside. You right. want to be able to jump into the conversation, and that's what this book does. Yeah. And so let's let's uh, let's move forward uh, really quick. Just hang on for a second, man. I and swear. By the way, one, one thing interesting while you're doing that the yeah. the forward to this book was written by Eric Von Daniken himself. Yeah, no, one step above me. See, Billy Billy <laughs> called. <laughs> no. Billy called and said, "Church." Uh, uh, I got Eric. Uh, so you wrote the four other book, two of my other yeah. books. I mean, you've yeah, done, I you know, I appreciate you so much for doing that. <laughs> I'm just you know? messing with you. I mean, and now, now let's, let's talk about this for a second. First off, when I saw this cover, I had to take a step back. I really had to take a look at, at what's going on here. Um, but uh, uh, tell us, it, it's uh, the fractal holographic universe, the matrix code revealed. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us about this. Well, you know, I have been one of my biggest and most famous lectures that I did years ago. I think it was like 2016 uh, was about the fractal holographic matrix and the nature of our universe being a fractal holographic light matrix. It was a three and a half hour lecture that I did in Northern California or somewhere in California. I can't remember the location, 
but it was an amazing lecture. And I had, during the research into creating that lecture, I had already had these concepts and theories, but the science that I discovered really solidified my own theories and hypotheses and really locked them down and gave me confirmation. And I knew all along that at some point, I need to turn this into an actual book that people can read, digest, and understand. Because people have heard me talk about the fractal holographic universe over the years in terms of short clips here, excerpts from a podcast, a certain thing I've said in this particular show or something. But to be able to get the full culmination of the understanding of what it means that we're living in a fractal holographic universe and to reveal the matrix code, not only scientifically, but also metaphysically, philosophically, okay? And I wanted to bring all that together and give a person a complete rounded understanding of what am I trying to say? What are the quantum physicists and theoretical physicists trying to say when they say that we're living in a fractal holographic matrix? And in this book, I break down fractals. What is a fractal? I break down I break down the actual code of the matrix itself, supersymmetry and, and adinkra, uh, adinkra codes. I then bring the science to that. I also break, break down the light matrix. What is an actual hologram? How does a hologram work? How do you break it down? How does that relate to our reality? And what is science saying about our reality when you zoom into the deepest of levels? And then I'm bringing all the philosophy behind that. And I'm bringing hypotheses and, un, and a broader understanding and wrapping it all around because I believe the spirituality, the philosophy, the metaphysics go hand in hand with the science. There was, let's talk about that for a second. This was my observation. You and I are friends. We're running around. We're doing things and, and, and all of that. But in in 2016, 2017, you and I were out doing uh, events together and, and shows and stuff. And I watched you get your feet on the ground. Something happened during that period. You were chasing the research. You were talking about it. But there were a couple of events, and we don't need to get into those specifically, but where, but you know what I'm talking about, where suddenly I went, holy crap, dudes arrived. What did you, what, what, what was going on? Did, did you feel it all start to come together in your head? Because suddenly I was watching you speak for two, two and a half hours improv, right? No scripts, yeah. nothing, yeah. right? Well, you were in a three-piece suit and sweating. Uh, that, that, that's another story altogether. I'm glad we're not doing that part anymore. But did, did something suddenly click? Uh, well, you know, I have been speaking in front of people for a very, very long time since I was a little kid. But bringing these types of complex concepts together in a way that people can understand them takes time and skill development, delivery development, do you go hardcore style? Do you go soft? Do you get how do you get to the middle? Understanding the people that you're talking to, their genre, their age group, uh, you know, even the race is important, believe it or not, because people perceive things in specific ways, in different ways, depending on where they're from and depending on how they were raised. And so there's this whole culmination of time that goes into finally being being able to deliver something and understand your crowd, understanding your genre understanding their level of even understanding by just reading the emotion in their faces. Uh, and so that just takes time until, you know, just like uh, anything, like playing a sport. In basketball, you have to practice all your fundamentals. Uh, and if you don't practice your fundamentals, you'll never be a great basketball player. I don't care how much natural God-given talent you have. If you don't work on the fundamentals, you won't get there. And I worked on the fundamentals for quite some time. And eventually, you know, you turn into a Kobe Bryant, you turn into a Michael Jordan, you know, you turn into a, a great player, right? And so um, it's just a matter of time before all those things culminate together and you can deliver something in a way that people can really begin to wrap their mind around it, understand it and feel it emotionally on a, on a higher level. Uh, and, you know, and that's that's just it takes it just takes time and patience and consistency of continuing to do those types of things. That's amazing. But you didn't answer the question. <laughs> is it so um i i remember um uh we went through this thing 
right? And and you spoke for two two and a half hours um, with with no was and you came off and you came up to me. I went, dude, and you said that felt pretty good. I go, I I. I'm going to have to watch this because I don't remember. Yeah. That's when you know, right? And and when when you you're able to connect the brain to the lower jaw and your vocal cords, that is the zone. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. That's the zone that you want to get into. And mm-hmm. did you know it at that time like okay, all right. Okay. I have the thoughts. Now I know how to deliver it to everybody so they can resonate. Oh, yeah. No, I definitely had to felt the zone. I mean, right before that presentation, I had done two in-person presentations, uh, I think at a Ritz-Carlton in Fort Lauderdale. And you get into this specific this uh, specific type of a zone where while you're talking, everything is flowing. You know, obviously, you know, that was a two and a half hour lecture, unscripted. No notes, no PowerPoint prompts, no uh, teleprompter, uh, all off the dome. And you have to be very concise and you have to push things in a specific order. You've got your talking points that you obviously can't forget. And then you have to also make sure you're driving the point home and getting to a culmination of your thought, like an epiphany at the end so that everybody can go, oh, now it's all making more sense. And to do that, you have to get into this zone. You know, I've been in the zone speaking like that, where I felt like I was even in the audience watching myself speak. And that's a particular level that you get to that's hard to explain. It's like you separate yourself from yourself and you're actually learning from yourself at the same time. It's another level of uh, of experiencing, you know, your ability to teach. It's like you, you know, the student becomes the teacher and then eventually the teacher becomes the master. But you are actually all three at the same time. Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. You're right about that. I remember. Uh, I want to get to this uh, this next announcement here, but I remember uh, Elizabeth and I uh, were sitting and watching you, and uh, it was about it was about an hour in. But I leaned over to Elizabeth. I go, "He's in the zone," and she goes, "He's in the zone. He's in the zone." And I, I think that's all Elizabeth and I said, yeah. right? But uh, yeah, yeah. Now. Uh, Let's get to uh, a very special announcement, and then we're going to get into the Anunnaki. Anunnaki is is heading across the United States. We're going to talk about those dates. We've got the Forbidden Conscious Awards coming up. We've got a trip to Turkey that's coming up, uh, a trip to Egypt that is coming up. Very, very busy year. But tonight we we are announcing on Saturday, June 22nd, Billy is going to be joining us out here in Los Angeles for Disclosure Fest and Stairway to the Stars. So, dude, thank you. That's going to be a big, big, big day. It's a three-day yeah. event at Castaic Lake. And, Billy, you're you're not only in good company, but this is going to be a magical event with, you know, 10,000 people. Yeah, beautiful. I'm looking forward to it. As you know, Jimmy, I'm doing it, man. You know, I love everything that you do, everything that you put your hands on. I believe in it. I wish I could have made it to the last one you had, but I was out of the country, um, unfortunately. But um, I'm looking forward to it. Elizabeth and I are coming down there, and we're going to give the people what they came to see. We're going to give them the knowledge, and we're going to always bring the receipts. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. And see, and, and which goes back to uh the point that i started off at the beginning of this show everybody you just listen to my words very carefully if billy needs something you need you have to have a short list of of people that are are not your friends right but that you depend on and that's it billy needs something he calls me and says jimmy i i need this 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 and this or elizabeth calls me i need this i get a text and 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 Elizabeth says, say these two words for me, and I, oh, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. And and you turn around and just get it done. I called you. I said, Billy, need a favor. It, it, it's not about okay, what now? It's mm-hmm. like okay, well, what is it? And yeah. that's how you progress, and that's how you move forward, um, which goes all the way down to this right here. All right, I'm very proud of this, my man. Very proud of this. Yeah. Very proud. And uh, again, uh, this is going to premiere here in Los Angeles at the Regal Cinema in downtown L.A. It's your new series. 
Um, I remember, uh, I want you to tell us about it first off, but I remember when the idea, well, the idea for this has been bubbling in your head for a couple of decades, Yeah. but, but last year you go, okay, church, I'm not playing around. This is going to be the way that I want it made me nervous too. I'm like, well, oh, because that's big, right? Yeah. That's big. You think that way, but yeah. here we are. It's uh, it's going to premiere May 12th, uh, right here in downtown LA. Uh, okay. Where'd the idea for the series come from? Well, you know, I have been studying and researching the Anunnaki for obviously, as you know, now decades and digging into a lot of these ancient texts and tablets and so forth from all around the world, taking trips around the world. Last year, I spent nine months with Elizabeth in hotels, nine months on this planet in hotels all over the world. Um, that's a lot of months. That's only that means we only spent three months in our own house. Uh, but all that was research, investigation, meeting with indigenous cultures, speaking with elders and sages and wisdom keepers from all around the world gaining and gaining and gaining more knowledge, doing my own research at ancient sites, some of those sites with you. You've been on some of those trips with us as well. And um, I knew that the knowledge is reaching a certain level where it needs to be revealed, but it needs to be revealed in a way that it has never been revealed before. And so I decided that I want to start at the very beginning. I want to go to the beginning, beginning. I'm talking millions of years prior and starting from that point with receipts and then moving forward in time. Uh, and I wanted to create a show that was unlike any other ancient civilization type of a show that exists, any other ancient astronaut type of show that existed. With respect to those shows, they're phenomenal and I love them and they have also helped me grow. But I wanted to do something a little bit different. Uh, and give people a different perspective and bring eyeballs to it that are more uh, progressive, younger crowd, things that can pull in even the older crowd. And we did it in a way that is going to be just totally stunning. And we're going to air these on IMAX screens. So you know the quality is impeccable. And we're going to air them L.A. first, but we're going to go around the country, Michigan, Houston, uh, Atlanta, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, New York. We're airing, the, the whole schedule will be released, but my, I really want to create something uh, to teach people about ancient civilizations, not only to teach them about what happened, but how we can learn from those past mistakes and create a better future for ourselves. Now, I want to share this with everybody, and you can go to uh, ForbiddenKnowledge.com and you can uh, look at the schedule, which is being updated all the time and yeah. and stuff. But uh, I'm watching the comments here. So everybody, May 12th uh, here in Los Angeles, May 18th in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, June 22nd, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. No, uh, June 22nd, Billy is coming to L.A. He moves the June that. 22nd date. As a favor to me, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Billy we'll and everybody else. Before, I don't know. We changed it. Yes, Elizabeth got it changed. Yeah. Uh, so th this will be updated. Uh, we've just put all of this together. It, everything is, man. I just got to be honest with everybody, Billy. This is a moving machine. We are constantly yeah. adjusting and tweaking things. So yeah. June twenty second, uh, Billy will be here in L.A. But June thirtieth, uh, Detroit, Michigan. And July 14th in Houston, Texas, August 2nd uh, through the 4th is the, now that's the Anunnaki premiere going across the country. Then we head back to uh, Miami for the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We're doing that again this year. Uh, but this year it's a three-day event, isn't it? Yes, three-day event. It's going to be an amazing event. Last year, you know, it was like the Conscious Grammys. But we're bringing it back. We're doing doing it even bigger and better. Three day event, a uh, celebrity basketball game with, with celebrities uh, on Friday evening uh, to raise money for children, underprivileged children. And then Saturday morning is going to be a speaking conference with about four speakers. I'll be one of the speakers in that conference the next morning at the same hotel where everybody's staying. And then that Saturday evening is a VIP super yacht party plated dinner with celebrity hosts. 
Uh, and then the next morning, Sunday morning, is a VIP book signing where you can show up with your books. I'll sign your books. If you don't have some, you can get books, and we'll take pictures and sign them there. Uh, Saturday, uh, Sunday afternoon is going to be the red carpet. This year, I'll stay on the red carpet a little longer. I'll be on there for about an hour, hour and a half, take a lot of red carpet photos with everyone, as many people as I possibly can. And then we have to go to the back because that's when the award ceremony, award ceremony will begin. Uh, and so that will cap off the night with the award ceremony where 14 amazing individuals will be, uh, you know, given amazing awards and given their flowers while they're still alive. Yeah. And, uh, and you can nominate and head over to forbiddenknowledge.com and click on that, uh, the upcoming tours, and then you'll see the, the awards there and you can click on that. So that's right. As if that isn't enough, mm -hmm. uh, right after that, uh, uh, heading to, uh, New York, uh, for another premiere of the Anunnaki at Union Square Stadium 17 in New yeah. York City. Yeah. Wow, right? And, you know, and, yeah. and it, it, it's got to be a really good feeling uh, to, to you know, do, do the work, do the work, do the work, do the work. But it's these things that it's your little uh, reward for all of the hard work, man. But going to Manhattan for a movie premiere that, uh, that is yours, is pretty amazing, man. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank um, you. It's great. It's, and we appreciate it. We just had uh, a billboard in Times Square. We had two billboards in Times Square over the weekend. Uh, one was for our esoteric uh, clothing line, and the other one was for Forbidden Knowledge TV. So we made it to Times Square. <laughs> so it's, this is all. This is a wild ride, man. We're just so happy and blessed and pleased and very happy for all the support from everyone. And uh, it gives us the energy to keep on going. Then uh, Turkey comes up September 1st through the 10th, going to Turkey. Yeah. So much to see there. And uh, there are certain uh, areas of the world. Well, it's, it's, it's every continent. There's something very, very megalithic, ancient, and, and, and special. Yeah. But, but Turkey is, is extra special. And so you're heading there September 1st through the 10th. Mm -hmm. Um, I was there when this tour got booked. I will never forget that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I swear. I, I, no, I was sitting next to Elizabeth Yeah, and <laughs> right. we were all together sitting next to Elizabeth. We're in this yeah. room, everybody with, with a group of our friends and somebody goes, so when are we going to go to Turkey? <laughs> and I watch, I'm sad. Everybody listen to me. I, I just look at Elizabeth Manton and when that happens, right? So Elizabeth and and, and people are going to think I'm exaggerating, Billy. Just tell them I am not. <laughs> I'm watching Elizabeth. Five minutes went by. Five minutes. Okay, tours booked. Everybody can register right now. Yep. I was like, what? Yeah. What, for what? And she had it laid out. Yeah. It was like that. So I'm going back to my point, everybody. Keep your foot on the gas. It's okay to talk, right? Mm -hmm. Go and get it done. And yeah. that's how you do it. I watched, I watched it happen in real time. <laughs> I'm like, man, can I take a breath? Elizabeth, can I take a breath? Can we discuss this? And it was already done. So that is happening uh, September 1st through the 10th. And um, you're going underground. You're going oh, above yeah. ground. Aaron Cooley, right? Aaron Cooley yeah. 12 stories deep underground to an ancient city, an ancient underground city designed to help uh, 30,000 people plus livestock survive some type of a disaster. 14,000 ventilation shafts bringing oxygen to the deepest levels. We're going to go all the way down all 12 stories and explore Daron Kuyu, a place where very, very few people have gotten the chance to even see on TV, yet alone be there in person. And then, of course, go Beckley Tepe. Go Beckley Tepe. Yeah. Go Beckley Tepe. And Darren Curry, let, let's stop there for a second. Yeah. Um, nobody, I want your ideas uh, on why they felt the necessity 
to build an underground city like that with like bomb proof rolling doors, which is to me uh, mm-hmm. one of the craziest things to see. But what what were the re- what what did you, what's your theory? What's your idea behind that? Was it um, extraterrestrial alien invasion? Was it cosmic? Was it natural disasters? Was it invading armies from the next village over? What were the because this is a gnarly, huge complex, you yeah, know, no, that can hold tens of thousands of people, plus all the food and livestock and everything else that you would need to survive. What was the need? Why, why did they yeah. do it? Yeah, no, let's go back full screen. Uh, so um, when you oh. look at the history of indigenous cultures all over the earth, you'll find something they all have in common. They have a story where a group of people that they describe as not being human, based on the description, they don't appear to look like them. They take them underground. Here in the Hopi, the Lakota tribe, they have the stories, they have the drawings on rocks showing that they were led underground by the ant people. Also, in ancient Egypt, if you go to the museum, at Cairo, the Cairo Museum, they still have the depictions of what the ancient Egyptians call the ant people that also took them deep underground to, to protect them from some type of either catastrophe or war. That part isn't so clear. Go to Turkey, Derun Kuyu, a huge, massive, and it's just one of many underground cities built to hold tens of thousands of people one incredible massive stone rolling door that a small child can close with one hand but from the opposite side you can't open it for that thick that thick yeah oh, yeah oh, forget about it it's, you can, it's like the wall of china Fourteen thousand ventilation shafts going down to the deepest levels no sign of any collapse of any of the material now jimmy check this out if I'm going to move that amount of landmass and excavate that amount of landmass to create an underground city, I have to have foreknowledge that what I'm doing is actually going to work. I have to have, first of all, an understanding of weight loads, calculus. I have to have understanding of geometry. I have to have an understanding of how much mass needs to be removed and how to excavate it properly without creating collapse. I have to understand where to offset weight in which angle and what location. And I have to know that it's all going to work out because before I have the resources of my entire civilization being used up to dig this thing, I've got to know that it's actually going to be done. It's going to be finished. It's going to be completed. So we're talking about foreknowledge. We're talking about blueprints. We're talking about advanced mathematics and advanced planning. They didn't just go, you know, let's start digging a hole and see what how, how this thing works out. It didn't go that way. This is real foreknowledge, and it shows us how much we really don't know. How do you get shafts only a few millimeters or a few inches wide to go down 12 stories? How do you cut that? It's not chicken bones and copper chisels. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. And 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 then you throw in the other element uh, where you have to understand gases. You have to know yeah. what oxygen is. You have to understand yeah. displacement of those gases, um, uh, how to breathe. If, if you can build it. How do you live there? How do you survive? Right. Mm-hmm. And and so all of that thrown into the rest of the engineering and complexities that are involved, there is a lot of knowledge that had to have been known. That's it. There isn't yep. another way to explain it away, is there? Yeah, there's no other way to explain it away. We they they had a high level of knowledge that even today we struggle to duplicate what was done at Darren Kuyu, what was done at Gobekli Tepe. And what I like about Gobekli Tepe is the fact that you've got these stone, megalithic stone columns that have animals on them that are not from that region. So, again, more evidence that people were moving around this planet in a way that we didn't believe they can do at that time, in that time period. But just for us, it's our time to discover these things. It's our time to open our eyes and wipe the coal, the coal out of the corners of our eyes and finally begin to see with new eyes and a new mind and a new heart 
and begin to question the mainstream and come up with our own hypotheses based on actual experience, based on actual study, research, and investigation, and begin to realize that what we were told and what we've been taught probably isn't accurate. The Earth probably isn't 6,000 years old. Uh, it's probably a lot older, and our story goes back hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. And when we take these concepts into play, uh, now let's talk about the Anunnaki. There is a thing that drives me, Billy, uh, that is, it, it's a thing called science. Mm -hmm. But I have an open mind. I have strange things that I'm researching and that I'm experiencing. And as I do that, it steers me back over to the science. And I need the science. Not all science is right. In fact, most science yeah. is wrong. It's just a series of corrections. But... <laughs> I need that to reinforce the woo-woo. I need yeah. that. I need that. So I don't just jump into the deep end of the pool. But exactly. here's the thing when it comes to the Anunnaki. Science, anthropologist, archaeologist will always point to, well, the missing link. Don't know what it is. We don't yeah. know. Homo sapiens sapien, our foreheads, our eyes, our cranium, our this, our that, our this. Uh, the 46 pairs of chromosomes instead of 48 and primates and us. And they always point to that. But they cough up this magic and say, well, it's about 200,000 years ago, 150,000, 200,000 years ago. They just stop right there. They don't have anywhere else to go. That's the science. Yeah. And then we push this over to our community and the researchers that have always been considered fringe that mm -hmm. uh, are, are looking at texts, looking at stories, looking at folklore, looking at mythology, looking at the stuff that has been spoken and handed down. Right. And that points to whether you go to the Sumerian Kings list or the Sumerian tablets or other cultures around the world that yeah. will talk about this shift and what happened with the cosmos and us when 200,000 years ago. Always 200,000 right. years ago. It's not That's coincidence. When, yeah. no, there's no coincidences. I mean, it's too. Listen, you have the Anunnaki and the Enuma Elish and the seven tablets of creation, the oldest version of it. You have the Anuna in most of the Sumerian tablets, which predates the name Anunnaki, same term. In the Bible, you have the Anak, right? You have also the Nephilim as well in there. You also then have the Nituru uh, in ancient Egypt, which is, are the same people. You have the Sumerian pantheon also becomes the Greek pantheon. They just rename the people different names, the same exact people. You have appearances of these people appearing all over the planet uh, at very di various different time frames. But one thing stays the same. Around 200,000 years ago, if you read the Epic of Atrahasis, if you read the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation, all of a sudden, poof, Homo sapiens sapien appears. I don't believe they made us from dust, but they did take an existing hominid, like they said in the Atrahasis, and they genetically modified it. They added their essence to it, and boom, Homo sapiens sapien, this version of us, uh, began to to uh, to live and progress. And... Um, it matches up with all the geneticists. It match matches up with all the scientists and biologists. And the Tower of Babel incident is supposedly around that same time period when the Tower of Babel was being built. And Enlil, who's known as Yahweh in the Bible, comes back and he gets all pissed off. And he says, oh, my God, whatever they set their heart to do, their minds to do, they, they can achieve it. And he's realizing, like, we are, uh, we are special, powerful beings that have the capability of creating. We ourselves are creators. And you can realize, wow, if they keep growing like this mentally and consciously, they'll realize they don't need us. So what does he do? He destroys the tower. Then he says, my seed shall not abide in man forever. His year shall be 120. Well, that made it into the biblical text, 120. So all of a sudden, chromosome number two is fused together. Telomere caps are put on the end. Man can only live 120 years. Man, now he says, I'm going to confuse the languages. He tells Stoke to start teaching different languages. They start spreading the, the people out, teaching different languages. Now they can't communicate. They can't be brothers in love anymore. Everyone's divided. Invisible lines are drawn called borders. And all of a sudden, we're all enemies. Divide and conquer has begun. 
And that's around 200,000 years ago. So all this stuff is culminating and happening in that time frame. How do I get the year number 200,000? Well, if they're saying that they're saying they genetically modified us about 200,000 years ago, because why? But when they look at chromosome number two, that happened about 200,000 years ago. So if that's this right. guy, I'm going to confuse their languages and I'm going to uh, shorten the lifespan. Well, that's a genetic modification. Then the science says, well, this happened 200,000 years ago. It's an artificial mutation. We don't know who did it. To me, it's no coincidence. It's the same people. And when you confront, and I have, right, when you confront um, an anthropologist, a biologist that is staying in their lane, and that's fine. I understand why they want to choose to stay in their lane. That's fine. But when they stay in their lane and you bring this up, their answer is always, well, you know, it's it's, it's luck. It just happened. <laughs> it just happened. They, 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 they don't have, well, things like this happen in nature all the time. You know what? No, they don't. No, <laughs> they do not. not. They do no. not, but but yeah. they don't have that answer. They're getting out of their own comfort zone, and I understand they don't want to leave their lane, but that's what they've been taught. That's what they yeah. teach in school. That's what they, when you get your degree and you get to that question, you get to that, an, well, uh, uh, luck. <laughs> you better tiptoe around it or you lose your job, lose your funding, all yeah. your grant money's gone. And they're like, look, I got to pay my bills. I got kids. I got a wife. I got a husband or whatever. I got mortgages, car payments. If I answer these questions or I start digging too deep into this, all that funding is going to disappear. Here, you know, Darwin, I'm not here for a Darwin argument, but it's too easy to win. But Darwin, in a weird way, had the right idea. Hmm. He was looking for the missing link and couldn't find it. Right? Couldn't find it. That part of Darwin, he was, you know, you know what I mean? He was trying to find those, and and it, it's not there. It, there isn't anything. And when you look at the gap between uh, and the ideas that not only Darwin, but anthropology today uh, sets forward, is evolution takes tens of millions of years to evolve, right. to change. Tens of millions of years. We went from Lucy or whoever, right? Whatever hominid you want to point at, right? Yeah. With with a sloping forehead and a different job, it, it, hair, you know, and 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 developed into what we are right now, the only version of us on this planet overnight. Yeah. And that's, so that's where Darwin, Darwin was looking for something that didn't exist. Yeah. He had the idea, but it's simply not there, is it? No, it's not there. And another thing that doesn't exist is be creating 8 billion people. I think there's 8 billion people on earth now. Mm -hmm. Creating 8 billion people from, from one or two people. It just can't happen. Thinking that Adam and Eve gave birth to 8 billion people, thinking that Lucy and whoever she made it with gave birth to 8 billion people. It's just an impossibility because why? There's not enough genetic diversity when you have when you start with two people. You need genetic diversity to create a busting uh, civilization, a bursting civilization. You can't have a civilization of people growing and developing and mating and continuing to have more and more generations from only two people. And if anyone doesn't believe that, just go and see what happens if you start mating with your own sister or your own mm -hmm. mother and having some babies. By the second or third generation, you're going to have a lot of deformities and you won't have any long lifespans either. Same thing happened to King Tut from inbreeding. Uh, you know, so he had a club foot. But the, the, the point is, two people don't create eight billion. So what does that mean? That means there were a lot of people around enough to create a busting civilization on this planet that can literally take over the whole globe. It didn't come from two people. Two people don't have enough genetic diversity to create anything, but except for a nightmare, a, a Frankenstein. So we got to keep that in mind. Now let's go. Uh, let's go back to the beginning before we get to the break here. Uh, the uh, the arrival of the Anunnaki. The question, first off, on top of all of that, is why? Why Earth? Why did they come here? Well, this is what I talk about in my TV series. Great question. I'm going all the way back 
and looking through ancient records, and I'm going on the accounts that indigenous cultures talk about from all over the world, the fact that they're saying that we were seated on this planet by Pleiadians. That's civilizations and, and peoples that were divided by thousands of miles in different time frames, asked by different people, totally unrelated, have the same exact verbal handed down history. Then you start looking. So that says, let me start looking into some texts. What can I begin to discover? I start discovering text that talks about a war originating in where? In the Pleiades, which is why it's mentioned in every ancient text. It's, it's on so many. It's on 75% of artifacts from the Middle East have a depiction of the Pleiades on them. They call Null Null in ancient Sumerian. The Egyptians worship the Pleiades. The Aboriginals worship the Pleiades, the Hopi tribe, the Lakota tribe. I can just keep going on and on and on. And this text now that I just started to discover is talking about a war in the Pleiades. Some of that war is even in the Mahabharata. And so I'm going, wow, there's a war. So here's the answer to your question. If planets are blowing up, because they had a weapon called the Brahma Astra and the Brahma Honda, all these incredible weapons that would destroy planets. Imagine if that weapon was used in this solar system and we're on Earth, but it didn't hit Earth, but it hit Mars or it hit Mercury. We're going to be panicking here. Why? Massive chunks of debris are going to come hurling toward us and possibly end life on Earth. So what will we do? Jimmy, if you and I had owned a spaceship, we'd be like, to hell with everybody else. We got to get out of here. And we yep. get in our ship and we leave. What are we doing? We're looking for another place to go. We're, we're now refugees. We're space refugees looking to create a what? A breakaway civilization. Earth was just one of many breakaway civilizations that were created. And as we found out now that they've populated other star systems along the way, Earth was just one of them. They came here to create a breakaway civilization as they were most likely, in my opinion now, space refugees. And I make a very strong argument for this in my new TV series, Anunnaki Ancient Secrets Revealed. Okay. So Homo sapiens sapien, we can safely say that number is 200,000. And there's reasons why. So let's just, let's table that. Uh, when did the Anunnaki arrive here? The Anunnaki arrived about 450,000 years ago. Right. Yeah, they work this planet, the EGG, the working class level Anunnaki beings called the EGG. They actually did most of the labor and they weren't slaves, but they were the working class. Just like if you and I owned a construction company and we had a master architect, me, you and the master architect, we ain't lifting nothing <laughs> except for a pen. Right. Mm -hmm. Then the master architect, he's got to have a foreman. Then the foreman's got a crew underneath him that knows how to actually follow the plans and do the work to make the stuff appear on the ground. And so they had this system. It's all talked about in the Enumi Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation and the Epic of Atrasis and some of the other tablets that exist that Enlil is talking about to his sister on a crystal tablet, how they're going to lay out the city plans and build these cities. And so the EGG were to bear that load, and they were working and doing this for a couple hundred thousand years without the help of human beings. But in the Epic of Atrasis, they get pissed off. They're like, we've been telling these people we need a break. The workload is too rough. They were also working on Mars and the conditions were rough on Mars. And they literally said, we're going to go to battle. So they had a coup and they came to South Africa to Adam's calendar and they encircled the camp of Enki, Anu and Enlil. And they began to get ready to go to war. And right before the battle began, Enki said, I have an idea. There's an existing being on this planet. If we can add our essence to it, we can get it to bear your load. And so a, a, a truce was made, a decision was made, and the genetic modification experiments began. And eventually the people that were here, our cousins, became Homo sapiens sapien, began to worship them as gods as they, insert, they inserted a worship gene, which geneticists have just finally found that there is a worship gene in human beings. When it's turned off, we don't wanna worship anything outside of ourselves. When it's turned on, we look to worship outside of ourselves. They then masqueraded as gods because why? What better way to get someone to work for you, not even knowing they're being enslaved, the thinking that they're honoring the gods. And that's exactly what happened. 
And uh, unfortunately, uh, they put that system in place so many thousands of years ago, but we're still working under that same mental enslavement and physical enslavement system to this very day. Now, uh, let's keep this going. Uh, there were mentions of, uh, now, all of this is going to be covered in the series in one way or another, but these are concepts uh, yeah. that you have been discussing uh, for a very long time. Um, the ideas of us, when you look at Homo sapiens sapien, that makes us different than uh, our closest, look at Cro-Magnon or Neanderthal or look at any other primates uh, on, or, or anything in the animal kingdom that's a mammal for that matter. There's things that separate us. Uh, the layers of fat on the skin. We need clothes to protect us from the heat and the cold, right? We need both. Uh, we don't have any hair. Uh, we've got, we're the only thing on the earth with a chin. And we do, still don't know why, uh, what yeah. the chin is, is there for. There are things that immediately separated us from everybody else. Isn't that evidence of if it didn't happen through evolution that somebody had to have come in and did the snip snip, uh, you know, on our DNA? Oh, yes, yeah, definitely more than enough evidence. When you in America, if you have enough circumstantial evidence, you can convict somebody of an actual crime. So if you imagine uh, the crime of creation of humanity in this civilization, you imagine it from a CSI mind perspective and you begin to look for enough circumstantial evidence, well, you can find it. You can find 20 to 30 incredible circumstantial points of evidence that will point to the fact that something was done to our previous cousin that altered the uh, evolutionary path that they were on. And now we are here as evidence of them, but in a totally different format. Uh, and we were the ones that literally came out as being the most advanced version of Homo sapiens sapien as evidenced in one of the uh, Sumerian uh, tablets, not tablet, one of the Sumerian cylinder scrolls where Isis is holding up a baby and she says that her hands have made it, the Adamu, which means first man. And so that tells, that speaks volumes, because what she's saying is prior to that situation, if you read the tab, as you discover that they were trying to make clones of our cousins. And they had successfully done that at the Hathor birthing houses, which you actually visited at the, at the Temple of Dendera. And then, but the problem they had with these clones is that they couldn't reproduce on their own. And so that's when the experiment began and Isis actually took a zygote, created a zygote. She took an egg out of an existing hominid, cleaned out some of the genetic material, added some of the Anunnaki genetic material, put it in her womb. We have in vitro fertilization now. And then she took it to term for 10 months, not nine, according to the tablets. And then you see that famous cylinder scroll where she's holding the baby up saying, my hands have created the Adamu, for, which means first man. And that was Adam. That was the first genetically mastered version of us. And then she tried to make Adam or they tried to make Adam with some of these people that were already here. And there were people here because it's evidence in the Bible. In the Bible, you have Adam, Eve, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. God comes back, who's actually in Lil, says, I'm kicking you out of here. He goes, the people out there are going to kill me. That's what he says in the Bible. Well, what people? There shouldn't be anybody outside. Well, what people are going to kill you? He says, don't worry, I put my mark on you. That way they won't kill you. They know who you are. They know your minds. And on top of that, when you get out there, you'll meet a wife. Then that started the Canaanites. So we know there were people here already, but they weren't homo sapiens sapien. And so uh, they said, OK, well, now let's take some DNA. We'll make a woman the same way, which they did. They made it Adam with Eve. It worked. They said, OK, now we'll make a whole bunch of Adams and a whole bunch of Eve. So they started this birthing system. And then they were able to get enough genetic material. And when you read these tablets, you find out something very interesting. They made them like animals. They kept them in these stalls and they can only made at specific times and specific days. And if they didn't do that, they would get in trouble. You see, so we're talking about a mass experiment. We're talking about an outdoor laboratory controlled by actual guards that had weapons. And the weapons that are talked about and the guards are, which are talked about in the tablets are the same exact guards that are talked about in the biblical text that are guarding the entrance to the garden. And when Adam is kicked out and Eve, he tries to get back in, 
they got weapons to stop him. And then he goes into the water. He tries to commit suicide. That's in the uh, one of the apocrypha text and the, the the book of Adam. You've got to read. So just the stories are there. The evidence is there, in my opinion. It's just that with the blinders on and the dogma that's been handed down from generation to generation, scientifically and religiously, we've been we've been programmed not to even see what's so evident and right in front of our own eyes. Now, isn't it uh, at a point now where even science is saying, uh, because of the evidence that is right there in front of us, and I'm talking about the asteroid Bennu and and the amino acids and the basic sugars of life that uh, uh, make up RNA, which is the, you know, single strand of uh, DNA. It's a single helix, not a double helix that gives the instruction set to DNA. This Mm -hmm. is flying around in the vacuum of space. (laughs) <laughs> right. So that yeah. says the obvious that the, the chemicals are chemicals, particles are particles, atoms are atoms, no matter what part of the universe that you are in. And these basic building blocks, these basic sugars that make up us are everywhere. And that DNA is universal. Why would we question these ideas and these concepts that the ancients have been talking about and handed down to us? Science is proving that the part of history that they want to argue about is now becoming fact. The dogma is not believable anymore, is it? No, it's not believable, man. I mean, it's, it's laughable. If anything, it's laughable. And that's why I write these books. That's why I do these lectures and these conferences and these podcasts and and everything else and TV shows, because um, at some point enough people are going to hear the message and begin to ask questions and begin to realize what they've been taught, what they've been learning, what they've been getting handed down from generation to generation. They themselves have been handing down is not accurate. And my hopes is that these people will begin or the world will begin to change the narrative by handing down more correct information or at least beginning to ask questions and do better research and question the current narrative stay right there billy let's take our break our guest tonight billy carson i'm your host jimmy church this is fade to black Subscribe to our YouTube channel, get your alerts, and access to over 2,000 videos. Click that subscribe button right now. My job is not to preach. My job is to take you on this journey. In a state of passion, nothing negative can happen. That it's the moons of those planets that would have life. Sometimes I see, you know, these energies also in your field. It is our passion and our pleasure. Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com and get the Fade to Black official podcast. 2,000 episodes, all of them commercial free for just $2 a month. This is Jimmy Church. Please visit and explore Egypt this October 3rd through the 14th, 2024 with Billy, Elizabeth, myself, and very special guest and the number one podcaster in the world, Sean Kelly. It's simple to do. Just go to ForbiddenKnowledge.com and click on Upcoming Tours or click on the link below. We'll see you there. 
Watch Into the Vortex on Gaia TV. It's fade to black for the screen. Simple to do. Go to Gaia.com, search Jimmy Church, or click on the link below. Follow Fade to Black on Twitter at J Church Radio. Get all of the show updates every single day. It's it, it's now called X, but who cares? How you doing? Jimmy Church here. Special announcement. Get your Fade to Black t-shirts. That's right. Help support the show. Help support everything that we do over here. We've got two t-shirts. We've got two ways to get them. And right now, if you get a Game Changer membership for a limited time, you will get Fade to Black Blend Coffee with your Game Changer membership. That's right. We have two t-shirts. We have the original, the classic Fade to Black t-shirt. You know you want one. Post a picture. Send it to us. We'll put it in our Fade to Black gallery. And we've got the new official Fade to Black t-shirt drawn by Michael Oming. Two t-shirts, two ways to get them. Get yours today. Everything is in stock. Everything gets autographed. Everything includes shipping, and you're going to get a tracking number. And with a Game Changer membership, you get an email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads of the show. Those are uploaded every single night after the show to the website. So don't delay. Get your Fade to Black t-shirt today. Go Backley Tappy. Go to jimmychurchradio.com and become a fade or not. Get a membership. That's right. Everything is commercial free. You have access to downloads and you get to call yourself a fade or not. River Moon Coffee, makers of the fade to black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black Blend, the Game Changer Blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Billy Carson is with us. We just made, now we were talking, we're going to continue talking about the Anunnaki. Uh, I do want to remind everybody that we made an announcement earlier. Billy is going to be here in L.A. Uh, June 22nd uh, for Disclosure Fest and Stairway to the Stars. And we're going to premiere the series at the event too as well so you'll be able to not only uh, come out and hang out with billy and 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 listen to his presentation but you're going to also be watching the premiere of the anunnaki here in los angeles on june 22nd and uh, and and thank you for doing that billy and and you know it's one of those things uh that uh when a premiere like this comes out, and that's that's one thing, but you and I have done enough stuff together over the years that when you say Jimmy, it, it, I'm quoting Billy, by the way, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but the imagery, the way that this is going to be put together and everything else, I'm going, I want this to be the biggest and the best. And I know that visually it is going to be right there and on point. Yeah. I'm very excited about that aspect of it. Your attention to detail 
to the public has always been, yeah, information, but you've got to present it too as well. You've got to have fun and 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 absorb it visually at the same time, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, the set that I'm on, I'm, first of all, I'm not sitting. A lot of these, you know, a lot of shows, nothing to take away from this. The sitting, you sit down and it's from the bust up, kind of like you see me here in this podcast, which is pretty standard. I just wanted to do something a little different. Um, so I'm standing, I'm walking, you know, I'm coming through stargates and I'm standing in ancient sites. I'm even on other planets looking back at the earth as I'm talking and describing and narrating. And then also, you know, we're going to have special guests So in the next season, you know, Jimmy Church will be in there. We'll have, uh, Paul Wallace possibly in there. Uh, various other people will come and be a part of season two. Um, but I just wanted to be able to do something a little different and I wanted to be able to bring energy to the screen. Uh, and I want to teach, uh, tell a story in a way that it has never been told before. And I think that we really have accomplished that. And I'm looking forward to these premieres and speaking live for an hour, uh, doing meet and greets. And then of course, doing a question and answer at the end of the movie. So it's going to be great. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the uh, the part about this that I want to talk now is Nibiru and and the concept of that and and its orbit. Uh, we can you know we have an asteroid belt that's there and and was there an extra planet? Uh, did Nibiru come and go? And and it's it, how does that fit into the narrative? Well, the story is a pretty massive story. When you read the seven tablets of creation, you begin to realize you're reading an astrophysics book. And when I say that, I'm not even joking. It reads just like you're reading an astrophysics book on the creation of our solar system. You realize through this text that it was Mercury, Venus, and then Tiamat. No Earth at that time. Tiamat taking the third position away from the sun, being four to six times larger than our current Earth. But in this text, there is this, and as in the beginning of any creation of any solar system, there's a lot of chaos. And even gravitationally, you have things called rogue planets and rogue solar systems that begin to collide and mix and me mesh with other solar systems. And in this process, in the Enumi Lish, one of the brown dwarfs, which had planets orbiting it, they call them satellites. One was named Nibiru. Now, in a newer version of that text, newer meaning about 4,000 years ago, uh, Marduk took Nibiru's name out and put his name in. We know this because we have both tablets. We can date the age period. But that Nibiru, uh, it, collided with, uh, it collided with Tiamat. And when it collided with Tiamat, it broke it into pieces and then a huge chunk swung away. Now, according to this text, Tiamat was a water-bearing planet with land and life. And it took the organic material, it separated the waters from the waters, which made it into the Bible, that exact statement made it into the Bible. From the Enumi Elish, identical, not one word changed. It's in the biblical text. Uh, and with all the organic material needed for it to recoalesce and become the Earth, Mars, which was an actual habitable moon of Tiamat, Lamu, it got swung into this crazy elliptical orbit around the sun, which all astrophysicists, mainstream science, they all agree that Mars's orbit doesn't make any sense and that they say it must have been orbiting a planet and got set free, which lines up perfectly with the Enuma Elish. And so Mars, we see in this crazy orbit because it was orbiting Tiamat. And when Tiamat exploded, the side of Tiamat that Chunks that broke off and hit Mars charred one side of Mars. Mars has one charred side and one smooth side. And of course, a complete evidence of a global flood and the weight from that mass hitting the planet tilted it 45 degrees on its axis. We've measured the axis already, the tilt. We know it had a pole shift of the crust. So it's all lining up with the ancient text. Again, mainstream science and ancient text backing each other up. And I believe that Mars was a uh, a, a habitable planet of this Tiamat, which now became the asteroid belt. 
And right after Mars, there's one more planet before the asteroid belt that nobody ever talks about. It's called Ceres, C-E-R-E-S, and it has more fresh water on it than Earth. And so after Ceres, then you have the asteroid belt. And uh, there's remnants of this rogue solar system still orbiting our sun. Mainstream astrophysicists teaching this now in modern day universities that there is a solar system within a solar system. There's another one way out there beyond the orbit of Pluto, but inside the Oort cloud, on the inner Oort cloud region, but way past Pluto. And they're saying that it orbits our sun now every 4,200 years. And it has satellites orbiting it. Uh, satellites meaning planets and moonlets and so forth. So there's a lot to learn about where we live in this particular location here in the, in the Milky Way galaxy. A lot to learn and so much more to go. We, we haven't even scratched the surface on what we know about where we live and our place in the Milky Way galaxy. I was listening to, uh, this is a couple of nights ago, it's very interesting that you just mentioned all of this. Uh, a few, excuse me, sorry about that. A few astrophysicists uh, discussing how Earth and our solar system was formed, right? I'm listening to this, and uh, these are just mainstream guys. And all of a sudden, Tiamat gets brought into the discussion and worlds in collision and, and the asteroid belt. I'm like, wait a minute. This is what we've been talking about for a very long time. And yeah. to have it go from, uh, you know, somebody like Sitchin or it, some of the uh, forward thinking uh, people that that wrote uh, Velikovsky and so forth, um, that wrote these things and were shunned today. Yeah. Go and look it up and, and see how science is discussing this today. They all bring up Tiamat and that yeah. the asteroid belt is the remnants of that. And there was other things going on before yeah. you couldn't talk about this today. It is now part of the mainstream. And I love that. Yep, absolutely. We're getting there. Little baby steps, man. Baby steps. We're getting there little by little. Now, okay, uh, uh, another another thing that comes up a lot, gold. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. uh, so let's let's discuss gold for a minute. Um, and and I have some issues. I want your ideas uh, about this. In that, I have gone and looked uh, with automation. There was a software that was written. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, and it was put online where you could go and look at the Sumerian text, pick a section of it out of any of the tablets. Uh, I think they have 10,000 tablets in the library uh, mm -hmm. there and go and pick it out. And then you can look at the direct translation and you can plug in search words. All right. So I'm like, OK, gold. Let's yeah. just let me see what's there. And, and I, maybe I was doing it wrong, but I couldn't, the other stuff is, is, is pretty, it's, it's a science fiction book for sure. Yeah. And it's, it's all yeah. there, but I couldn't find the direct references to gold, at least the way that Sitchin was doing the translation. Yeah. Uh, right. Can you comment on that? Yeah. I never found any reference to gold either. I don't think Sitchin took his translation for gold from the Sumerian tablets. I think, and first of all, he didn't translate the tablets, by the way. They were already translated. He only took existing translations. A lot of people believe that he was a translator, a linguist of some type, but he wasn't. He he just took it and he gave the references to where he got his, his uh, put his story together. But if you read his books, you'll see that every so many paragraphs, he gives a reference as to where he came up with the idea for that particular theory. And so he's pulling from all the different texts, many, many different texts, not just the Sumerian tablets, everything you could think of, even biblical, Torah, Talmud. I mean, he's getting it from everywhere. So not just only uh, the Sumerian tablets. But yes, I don't see any reference to gold in the Sumerian tablets whatsoever. Where what's interesting is I think he's coming up with, I thought he came up with a hypothesis based on what other ancient cultures deemed to be extremely important an important element of the gods and they were where they would adorn themselves with it as a certain level of 
uh, uh, I guess, appreciation to the gods, but also a certain level that they have or owned in, a, in, in, in the, their civilization, right? And so if you look at what the Anunnaki were doing in these tablets, you realize, to me, they were creating a breakaway civilization. Now, is gold important? I think gold is important for any technologically advanced culture or race because gold, the element itself, has a lot of technological purposes. We think it's just to wear jewelry and look nice, but really it's for electrical components, microprocessor chips, heat shielding, and all these other great things. You can't do it without gold. Uh, and, but again, there's no specific direct reference to gold at all in any of these Sumerian tablets. Uh, I think that they were just utilizing this planet as a breakaway civilization as well as Mars. Could they have been mining resources here? Quite possibly, I think they could have been. What they were doing with those resources is not quite clear. It's up to interpretation. And so it's up to every individual and every individual person to figure out what they think might have they might have been doing with some of these resources. Uh, in my opinion, I think they were just building more cities throughout our solar system, uh, personally. But, you know, I think Sitchin did a great job in trying to paint a picture and come up with his own hypotheses and ideas. Uh, did he get some things wrong? Quite possibly. I don't think anyone has 100 percent accurate information on this entire epic. But all we can do is get as close as we possibly can based on circumstantial evidence, information and our own interpretations, which is why people should research and ask questions and dig deeper and see if they can come up with some ideas and concepts that maybe we haven't even thought of yet. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And see, the the other part of this is so much was put on uh, the, the Anunnaki mining gold to turn it into dust to protect their atmosphere and, and, and shield the, the rays of the sun. And there was so much discussion and debate in and around this that I, I did my due diligence and I went to yeah. go and, and, and try and find it and I couldn't. Yeah. And so I, I just, I have deleted that part of the story from my research. And so you've done the same as what you're saying. Yeah. You've never heard me talk about Anunnaki no. trying to go mine gold for, to, to fix their atmosphere. I've never once talked about it on any TV show or any lecture conference workshop i've never because i couldn't find any reference of it so and i could because i couldn't put the pieces of that puzzle together from his ideas or concepts i never used it now uh okay why did the anunnaki leave or did they well a lot of them left some stayed there was a war a second war a pyramid war that happened and this war was so great they used incredible weapons there's one weapon that they said they were when they released this weapon and this is coming from the indian text when they released this weapon it couldn't even be pulled back there was no way to stop it uh and whoever had control of the tablet of destiny controlled this sector of the galaxy and this weapon was so severe it would heat things up and if you look at the evidence of this war you can actually see it throughout mohenjandaro in the indus valley where buildings and sand has been turned to glass, where dead bodies lay radiated in the street till this very day, where you can go there with a Geiger counter and you can test the background radiation versus the radiations in their dead bodies for thousands of years. It's still there and animals have never tried to eat that, eat those dead people because they, they're too smart. They know that if they scavenge these dead bodies, they're gonna get sick. And then you look at the sands of Egypt. A lot of people think, and I think a lot of mainstream scientists and geologists think that it's a naturally forming desert. When we know it was a lush place, you got to ask yourself, why did it go from such a lush place to such a dry and arid place? The Nile was right next to the pyramids. The pyramids were built on top of the aquifer, where the, which was fed by the Nile. How in the world did that place become so dry and so much desert? Well, in my opinion, I've done this. You can, if you go to a nice spot where there's soft sand and just keep putting your hand, keep putting your hand down there, or get a small shovel and start digging, you'll find small balls of glass. The same balls of glass that the Egyptians, uh, the art artisans will carve into scarab beetles to honor the, the gods. Well, that, that glass is sand that's turned to glass, and that takes 3,000 degree temperature heat. And I think all this is leading to the evidence that there was some type of a massive war that 
blew up part of the Bent Pyramid. Muhammad Ibrahim agrees with me on this. Blew up some of the other pyramids within that region, scorched the, the land and dried out that area and turned some of that desert into glass. And then also destroyed Mohenjo-Daro and many other areas within the region. More evidence of some type of ancient war that happened with weapons that were so phenomenal they can reach 3,000 degree temperature heat. And in one of the tablets, it talks about the fact that the people of the, the black faced people of the land, their eyes were bleeding, their hair was falling out, their fingernails were falling out. That's the exact terminology it uses. It sounds like radiation sickness to me. Uh, and then so one of the Anunnaki, Enki, he goes to his, his father, Anu, and asks him to stop the evil wind from going across the land because it's killing everything. And his father says, I can't stop it. The best thing to do is get into your skyship and forebode, which means get the hell out of here. And so I think a lot of them left, but I also do think that some of them did stay. Uh, and we could be walking amongst a lot of their offspring till this very day. Okay, I'm going to share something with you that we have not talked about. All right? And I'm glad you're sitting down. And Elizabeth is listening right now, and she's about to go WTF. Okay? <laughs> All right? Are you ready? Yeah. I was regressed about six mm. months ago. Okay. All right. So in this regression, which I, which involves you and I, I for transparency, tell everybody right now, you have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. Do you? I have right? no idea. You can regress. No I think yeah. regression means you have to go right. see somebody and right, 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 I haven't right. heard anything about this yet. Okay. So check this out. Um, here's the precursor. For everybody that doesn't know, uh, I'll just tell you this briefly. Billy and Elizabeth and I, the last couple of years, we got a bunch of friends together and we uh, got together here in Southern California uh, for a UFO sky watch. We had a great time. Right. And, and so we did this last year. And so Billy and I and 20 friends and Elizabeth uh, were on the top of this mountain here in Southern California, next to Giant yeah. Rock. And this gold ball goes up to the west, and it's coming towards us. It's low in the sky. And yeah. I look at it, and it was it was pretty, pretty amazing looking. And it's coming straight at It's low, and it's yeah. coming at us. And Billy goes, it's an airplane. <laughs> and, and Billy, because he's a great camp counselor, Right. Yeah. <laughs> and he's telling everyone, don't shine your lasers on it. We don't want the police here. And 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 I'm and and we didn't because right. Billy's right. And <laughs> but I'm looking at this and I'm like, ah, and it's coming closer to us. And then it flies. Oh, and now when it gets over us, it's a big gold ball. Yeah. Now now listen, everybody, there's 20 other people here. Yeah. Seeing this, it's not just Billy and Elizabeth and I, but Billy and Elizabeth and I are standing together and we're looking at, and then it, it slows down. It's right above yeah. us and it's a gold that, and, and, and I'm looking at it with the knife and uh, Billy, there's no lights on this thing. I know. No uh, wings. <laughs> not, not, and, and then it turns and then goes straight up, straight yeah. up. And disappears and turns into a and, and is gone. And Billy, gone. Billy says, "Billy, I love you, man. Uh, I, I reserve the right to say that that wasn't an airplane." Okay, so that's that's what happens. Okay, all right. So I go into this regression session with Sarah Breskman Cosme, and we do it on TV. We tape it. Okay. All right. Now, and I tell Sarah nothing. I said, let's just just get inside my head. It's okay. Let's mm -hmm. see what happens. And, dude, this is what comes out of my mouth. And you know nothing about this. So I want to know what you saw. But this is what I say. <laughs> Jimmy doesn't know about this. Mm. That's what comes out of my mouth. Wow. But he was taken aboard a craft in wow. in Palm Springs, mm. 
and 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 I'm like, what? And I this is I, I'm I'm hypnotized, right? I can hear the words coming out right. of you know my higher self or whatever, but that apparently, okay, I'm just saying this is what I said that I went on board that craft mm-hmm. for five seconds. Mm. And and so and then I'm shown the room. I see it and I scan around this room. I look at these ETs or whatever. And then I'm back standing next to you. Wow. It was just 5 seconds. So, I want you to go back to that moment. Forget about what I saw and all of that. I can we can talk about that off of the air and, and whatever. Yeah. But when we were do, do you did did I zone out? Or, or any, do you remember? I'm asking you, I've never talked to you about this. Yeah, and, yeah. and maybe Elizabeth's going to walk in the studio going, <laughs> but um, do, do you remember? Did, did I do anything strange at that moment? Or did you remember anything that stands out? There was an awkward silence that we all had because this thing came from so low and it came across right above us. It was like, for me, it was an awkward silence. Um, I was just kind of in shock because, you know, we were here to hunt for UFOs, obviously, but I didn't think I'd see one that close to us. Uh, and for this thing to take off from the ground almost and come right above us. And then there was this really weird, awkward silence. And to be honest with you, I was really fixated on the sky and Me what too. was going on there. And when this thing stopped and then all of a sudden went straight up and just went into space. Um, so I don't know, man. I, it could have been. I mean, I, I don't know I, either. I don't know. It was, know so either. Awkward. it was so weird because we were all in shock. We were all in shock, and and so in w- my memory of everything. So I go, and it's like five seconds, right? I l- I look around this room, and they like acknowledge me, and then it ends, and you and I are looking at this thing flying away. Wow! So that's that's, that's all I got. That's all I got. That's all I got. And I couldn't. I could not believe. The experience now going through the regression and that it it was pretty amazing, but I didn't know anything about this at all. And my description of what I saw and what the beings look like, I've never heard anybody talk like this before. And it was very strange to me, but at, at the end, right. When I'm, when I'm back, you and I and Elizabeth, the three of us were standing there together. We're all looking up at it as as it was going away. Pretty crazy, huh? That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, listen, and anything is possible, man, because, you know, at the experiences, experiences that I've had when I was a kid, um, all the way up until, you know, seeing all these UFOs and going on these UFO hunts and actually seeing them, the one that flew over our head and at the Great Sphinx in Egypt and all these crazy things. It's just like. Who are we to question anyone's experience? If someone says that they experienced something or felt something or feel something or go through a regression and information comes out, the mainstream says ignore it, it's dumb. But we have to think with a higher level of consciousness and say, you know, it's possible that whatever that person experienced actually happened to them. And maybe we aren't privy to uh, that information or how or, or even being a part of the experience with them. But something happened. There's too many people saying that things have happened, too many regressions speaking about things that have happened. And when you have those kind of sheer numbers, to me, that's also circumstantial evidence. Billy just mentioned something uh, that happened at the the Great Sphinx. And so let's let's talk about that for a second, because that was the, the, the gold ball that you and I and everybody else saw. That was... That was one of the coolest things. And you and I have seen things together a lot over the years, right? Yeah. But that that was, uh, you know, in Palm Springs, that was crazy. It was yeah. beautiful and, and everything else. But uh, last year, we, we go to Egypt, and uh, we, we go down to the Great Sphinx in the morning so we could see the sunrise, right? Okay, so that's – and it was, it was incredible – and and so we're we're at the back at the tail of the Sphinx with Muhammad Ibrahim, yeah. and we had all of us were there. So there was like eighty of us. And at that moment, somebody says, "There's a there's a UFO," 
Yep. And we all kind of turn and look. I saw the last part of it, but we got it on video. He was already that recording was- us talking. So he got, when he saw it, he put the camera phone up and he recorded the whole thing. We have a great video of this thing, which is incredible. Uh, it, it's the crazy, man, it yeah. is the crazy, it's, it is one of the best videos like that I have ever seen in my life. And we were all there for that. Yeah. I mean, it's so when <laughs> I remember all, of, what went through your mind when you saw the replay, we saw it, but when you saw the replay of that video, what, 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 what the first what, thing what, I thought was, man, this must be, it's gotta be a bug. Even though there wasn't enough light to illuminate a bug, unless it has its own illuminescence. But then after I looked at the video, I haven't sent me the video. He sent me the video. I sent it to my editor to have to take a look at it and come to find out it wasn't a bug. It's not a bug. It's an actual object that really is meters above us flying around and then just takes off. Uh, this, thing li- this, is, this thing lights up and launches. Yeah. It's yeah. Oof, uh, man. It is a great. I remember. uh it was one of those things like you, I reserve the right to say that that's not an airplane, right? Okay. When I watched that again and, and went back and, and really looked at it, I thought to myself, that is an object in the sky mm-hmm. flying. Yeah. That that there, there's no uh, because I said and I remember I man I put my foot in my mouth all the time I said in front of everybody there ah that was a shooting star I said it man I said it, right? I said it. Yeah. and then I went back and looked no oh 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 no oh, shooting star can go from the ground up and we've got this video we played it on our podcast our Egypt podcast on our YouTube account. It's going to be in the on the Anunnaki TV show. It doesn't move. Uh, a shooting star doesn't go from down to up. It goes from up to down, usually in an angle. Uh, this thing moved and turned and pivoted a few different ways, and the bright the light was bright and crispy clear, and we know that it wasn't a bug. Um, and so some forensics have been done. It's going to be a great video and a great addition to the Anunnaki TV show, showing that hey, we're we're having a sunrise at the Great Sphinx, and all of a sudden. We happen to catch something extremely strange, an anomaly in the sky right above us, completely silent, by the way, no noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was, I mean, it it was low and right there. And it was, it was, okay. All right. Everybody just, just listen to me for a second. This is what I think. And I've looked at this video a lot. I have it. Um, I think there was an interdimensional, I'm going there. A door opened and that thing left. That's what I think. And and it was it was going up and 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 away. Everybody it was right there. It was right right yeah. there. That thing lights up and goes. And mm-hmm. that's that's what I think. I think it was like a, a stargate or something. Something opened and it flew through it. Yeah, that's 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 my take. Yeah. I know it sounds crazy, but uh, hey, what, we what had. Else? We had, uh, I don't know, 80 people with us, 80 people all sort of same thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm so glad that uh, the doctor that was with us got it on video because he, he was recording us talking about the weather patterns of the of the um, enclosure of the Sphinx and how water was flowing from west to east uh, because of a catastrophe. Uh, and so that's when the camera phone was out. And at the same time, that's when he saw the light. And he looked up and he said, hey, and everybody looked up. So we caught something really amazing that day. It was like the perfect time, the perfect place. Everyone it that was, was with us it was, the floor was blessed. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, last uh, couple set of questions here. Uh, I want your opinions. Uh, right now, there is a lot of chatter. There's been some stuff uh, in press releases over the last couple of weeks about a couple of different groups of astrophysicists that are working uh, at looking at exoplanets. And an announcement is about to happen 
uh, from the James Webb Space Telescope about mm-hmm. a techno signature and the announcement of so, but but the two groups are talking about two different planets, and the arguments are there. So the question is, do you think the announcement will come from the science community and something like the James Webb Space Telescope that will open the door to uh, the government and state actors around the world to now discuss life out there? to have it announced this way as opposed to we have flying saucers at at, at Skunk Works, right? Yeah, do, right? Do you think that there's going to be something eminent and it's going to happen that way from science and not from another way? I Well, I know it's going to happen from science, uh, and I would like it to be from the James Webb for them to say, I know that they're going to really see that there's something technological going on on this exoplanet. I already know that's going to happen because they've seen this before. The problem that they have with that is it's so advanced that it's scary. It it scares them, which they then want to keep us scared about it. But because we're supposed to be the pinnacle of creation. And so why would we tell them this is their mindset? Why would we tell them about somebody that's out there that's far more superior than us? Probably a type one civilization that's harnessed the energy of their planet and their sun and maybe are uh, living inside of a Dyson sphere. Right. So. What, what I think would happen most likely is that the science kit that's currently operating on Mars on Perseverance is going to transmit back the samples and they're going to tell us that they discovered alien life on Mars right here and that this alien life is bacteria. They'll start with bacteria first, something microscopic, something not non-threatening unless you get it inside of your body, <laughs> but non-threatening, not scary, not a little green man with antenna, not another person walking around that looks like us, because I believe most advanced life in the universe looks like us and we look like them. Not exactly, but bilateral bipedal hominids that have hands that can manipulate the environment. Because I'll tell you what, if a dolphin who is much smarter than a human being had hands that can manipulate the environment, we'd be in trouble. So uh, it didn't take a didn't take an immense amount of intelligence. It just takes these and some dreams. And with these and dreams, you can get out off this planet. Uh, so I think it's going to be bacteria first. The James Webb thing is going to be sensational, but then I think eventually it's going to kind of just dissipate to the side. But the big story is going to come from the science kit and the bacteria soil on Mars. If, if we, let's, okay, it's a big if. Let's say Elon makes it to Mars or NASA makes it to Mars. But if, if it becomes a private enterprise, is that enough to keep the man from blocking anything that would be seen or found on Mars, that a private enterprise wouldn't be blocked. You know, it's kind of like the movie Contact, if you think about it, right? Immediately, yeah. the government comes in and steps in between. Is is that... Already an, right, 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 right. It's happening yeah. as you and I are speaking, actually. Yeah, they're, they're blocking um, Elon Musk. They're blocking SpaceX. They're blocking Blue Origins. They're blocking Bigelow Aerospace. They're blocked. They, 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 they can't say what they want to say, because if they say what they want to say or tell what they know, then they will have their rights to clear airspace and, and travel through space removed and revoked. And if that happens, then they just use the, 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 the space based weapons that we have and destroy them. You know, they use to the scale our weapons and blow them out of the sky or don't let them gather a proper orbit. All of a sudden, all of his an EMP goes off in space and all of his Skylink goes down. So they have him by the you know what's. And so he's only allowed to say a small amount of things. And you'll see people on Mars and you'll see people pretending to be in tin can, living in tin cans and smiling in space suits. And we'll think, man, they're going to live and die in those cans. But when they go behind the mountain, when the cameras turn off, they're going to a full and complete infrastructure that's already been established. Uh, do you believe that the Anunnaki are going to return? 
I believe that they are going to return. I think that some of them are already here, probably in Antarctica right now. Um, and I believe that, uh, and Anunnaki, let me be clear on this. Anunnaki doesn't mean um, one specific group because Anunnaki is a generalized term. It can mean a multi-race of entire space species. So the Anunnaki that were here, we know now just looking at ancient texts that they were from even different planets and different star systems. You have some from Sirius, some from Eldebron, some from the Orion, all these spread out different places. So they were a multi-species group of people that collaboratively built an Atlantean civilization. And so I believe that we are going to get visited by beings from space again, that people will come back. But right now, I believe that they're in a watching and holding pattern. I think that we're being watched. I think that we've been, t well, the military has been taught that they're not going to use nukes on this planet. And the evidence of this is what happened when they showed up at all the nuclear flights and disabled the nukes, which we have the testimony from actual nuclear physicists, nuclear rocket scientists, and mil nu nuclear military officers that worked at these flights that were there when the UFO showed up and they testified to this fact. So it's not even a mystery. It's mainstream news. It was on CNN. And so uh, I think that uh, we're in a situation where they're waiting for humanity to grow up. Right now, we're like a baby crawling and we're trying to learn how to stand up so we could take our first step. And just like a baby, though, we will fall flat on our stomach trying to crawl and everyone will get sad. And, oh, my God, we're going back down the tubes again. But it's all a part of the process. Eventually, we will grab onto the edge of a table and pull ourselves up. People are going to get so excited. Man, we're making great progress. But when that baby takes its first step, it usually falls and it cries. And that's what's going to happen to us. But it will pull itself back up again. It will take more steps. And eventually that baby will learn to walk. And what is walking? Walking is a series of controlled falls. That's the actual definition. And that's where mankind is going. And the moon. Uh, just really quick, but, uh, we've just got a, a little time left together, and thank you, by the way. Um, yeah. it, it, is is the moon artificial? And if if you think that it is, it it is a pretty strange thing in its perfection, in in its job with us. That it's it's pretty interesting. It seems kind of deliberate. But then we have the comments over the years that when we landed, it rang like a bell. And yeah. the other comments of, about they're here watching us that the astronauts <laughs> talked about in the radio chatter. Um, yeah. Do you think that that is the case or is the moon a natural uh, occurrence? I think that the moon was put into place to help balance and stabilize Earth's wobble. It was put at a particular range from the Earth itself. Uh, and it was put into a geostationary lock to where as it spun, as we spin on our axis, it spins on this axis so we can only see one side because I believe on the back side, I don't call it the dark side because it's not dark, it's just the back side. I believe that there are structures there and a, what a perfect place to put a base hidden from the eyes of humanity. When uh, a friend of mine who was in the Black Knight Satellite documentary, Chris Maroney of Mars Anomalies YouTube account, he went and got the USGS.gov radar images of the moon when they did ground penetrating radar from Earth at the Arecibo uh, satellite dish before it broke. Fortunately, he was able to get this done years ago. It, 30 meters beneath the, the surface of the moon, you clearly see structures. And I'm talking about what we would consider to be from our perspective in our minds, we would say magnificent, gigantic steel beams or beams of some type of metal or metallic nature beneath the surface of the moon. If you look at all those craters, they always seem to be almost the same exact depth. And you never see anything that hits it in an angle and slides into a particular spot. You don't see any skid marks. It always looks like things came straight down. Almost impossible that something like that can happen. And then you look at the Clementine mission, which is a former military mission to the moon via satellite, low lunar orbit mission, and we have gigabytes of images from that mission. Well, the mission never returned. They transmitted the images, but the satellite itself got lost. When it got to the backside of the moon, it hit something and it got stuck. This is declassified information. 
And uh, the data shows things that look like structures. So what I believe the moon is, is an artificial construction from maybe something that used to be planet-like. They used their technology like they did in Darren Kuyu, carved it out, made it into a habitable space base, put it into a particular level of orbit with the Earth to balance the wobble to make Earth habitable because it wasn't habitable in a way that maybe they would like it to be in terms of supporting hominid life and mammal life. Uh, and then, of course, they put it into that particular rotation on its own axis. And it's a great place to launch missions to uh, deeper into outer space as well because of the low, uh, the low gravity. Uh, so I think there's a lot, a lot of information, a lot of knowledge with the moon that also can be looked at in the ancient tablets when one of the family members were having a coup against another family member. Two big groups were battling and one group lost and they were banished to the moon in this ancient text which is pretty interesting because one of the black box audios of Neil Armstrong is saying that he bets the people down there as they're flying over. He says, I bet the people down there never get out. And that's in the black box uh, audio and the redacted black box document that was declassified through Freedom of Information Act. And anyone can download it and, li and listen to it or read it for themselves. I want to share this with you before I let you go. <clears throat> A couple of days ago, what's today? Tuesday. So a couple of days ago, it was either Saturday or Sunday. Um, I'm out in the desert out here riding my Harley. Okay. And I'm just, I, I head out and I head over to Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, Billy, you've been here. You know what's around me, right? So yeah, I'm out and I'm on this road. And, uh, and I stopped, I got bugs on my visor. So I pulled over, uh, at the Moroc dry lake bed. I found this little road and that was blocked off, but it was a place for me where I could park my Harley. You don't want to park on the side of the road. You get hit by a truck or something. And so yeah. anyway, I pull over, wipe in my visor off. And I look up and I see this really cool sign, warning, right? You're on an Air Force installation, you know, no no photography, no, no one off, right? And I, I take a selfie. I see another sign. It's lower. It's right in front of me. I went, oh, okay. I'll go over and I take a selfie of that. At that moment, yeah. I think I'm alone. They pulled up. They rolled up. Mm -hmm. The camo dudes. Yeah. <laughs> right? SUV pulls up and I got busted. Busted. Oh, busted. 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 This just happened. And yeah. here is for you, Billy. There's a picture. So yeah. there's the there guy. There, 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 there they are. And I take they tell me, right? No more, no more selfies. So while yeah. they're writing me up and doing their thing, what do I do? <laughs> Oh, I take man. one you more selfie. You're crazy, yeah, man. yeah, yeah You're I'm, crazy. I'm crazy. So, so they they get out after about ten minutes, and and it's 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 heavy, it's gnarly, and it's serious. I'm not making light of this. These guys are just doing their job. Yeah, but you know why they let me go? Why? Why? I said, I know Billy Carson. Hey, Billy, thank you so much, my friend. Thank you so much. We've got a crazy, crazy, crazy. <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a crazy year in front of us. Um, yeah. and we've got a couple of premieres we're doing out here in L.A. We've got stuff we're doing around the country. We've got uh, the Bentley giveaway. Uh, we've got the new books that are out. We've got uh, the Forbidden Conscious Awards coming up. Uh, we've got uh, Turkey. We've got Egypt. I'm not going to Turkey, everybody. I've got other stuff. Um, I'm going to miss that, but I will be going to Egypt. Everything you need to know, and if you want to come out and hang out with us, head over to ForbiddenKnowledge.com. Go and get your subscription to Billy's work over at Forbidden Knowledge TV. And Billy, safe travels, and I'll be seeing you shortly, my friend. Thank yeah. you so See you much. Soon, my friend. Love you, man. Appreciate you. Thank you. Billy Carson. Thank you so much. Billy, I'll talk to you first thing in the morning. All right? All right. Cool. All right. Billy Carson right there. Sorry, I just cut Billy off. Uh, thank you so much. And everybody, what a great, fun, amazing show. I learned a lot today. It's uh, Billy 
We, and again, it's all simple to do. Forbiddenknowledge.com, forbiddenknowledge.tv. Everything is right below. Go follow, like, and subscribe. Everything is right there. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, tomorrow night on the show, Mary A. Joyce is with us. We're going to be talking about her book, Spy in the Sky. That's right. Images, ET, craft. Up there, down here, Antarctica, in the water, on land, all of that and much more tomorrow night with Mary A. Joyce. So get ready for that. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jonicide. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2024 by Fade to Black the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Mary A. Joyce, I want you to be safe. Go Beckley Tepe.